I tell you, we are all over, I, you know, there's celebration of uh, graduations all over our country, and, and a lot of people are off with family somewhere and celebrating graduation with their family and a college graduate or somewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, so this brings back all kinds of memories uh, for me. I remember, you know, I was the first, first person in my family to graduate from high school. So that was a real big deal, and um, I didn't know what I was going to do, and, you know, so I, the next day, my dad bought me a one-way plane ticket to Texas, and so <clears throat> that's a true story, true story, and I went to the workplace, you know, I went to work, and then my, grand, my grandmother that summer said, what are you going to do, and I said, I don't, I don't know, and um, she said, well, go down to Hardin-Simmons University, that great university up in West Texas, how many of y'all know where that is? Thank you. We, we'll, we'll bring up a map next time. That's a great. Some of you know really reached up because you paid tuition there or for one of your children. And, uh, but, you know, stumbled, stumbled into the middle of God's will. Some, some, sometimes you got things ironed out and sometimes you're just not quite there. But God is with you. And that's a good thing to know. Amen? And I, I want to tell you something. I love Caleb McClary. Where'd you go, Caleb? Where are you? Where'd you go, Caleb? Raise your hand. Help me to see you. Where is he? He's right there. He left. He went to the workplace. Man, he was serious. Um, I love that young man. I don't think there's a more tender-hearted person than Caleb. And I appreciate uh, Ricky and Sarah and family coming along him, being a family uh, for him. Right, amen. And um, and then you know I'm just getting to know uh, Alex Lopez. I, I like that kid. And his parent, did, you're, you're here. Where are we are? Man, I like that kid a lot. Um, looks like he's going to turn out okay. <laughs> That's all right. And he's a theater kid, and I, I I love that we have that in common. I was a theater kid, and uh, man, he's he's awesome. I look forward to hearing him sing here. And then, you know, uh, Miles Mathis. Now, Miles has been here the whole time that I've been here. He was here before I got here a little bit. And, you know, we put pictures out here on this little board of people in the newspaper. For a while, it has been the, the Mathis family board out there, I think. Uh, man, all their accomplishments. And, uh, and I love this family. And, it, and it's that combination of, of parent and child working in, in partnership for their future. And it's hard work. And, you know, I was, uh, some of you will be uh, empty nesters. You know, my mother cried. My dad tore down the wall between their bedroom and my bedroom and expanded um, and bought a riding lawnmower, and I still haven't gotten over that. <clears throat> it's a big deal. Big, big deal. So I want us to look at this passage today. By the way, we have any other graduates here that maybe we haven't had opportunity to celebrate that we want, would you stand and let us see you if you've graduated or you're about to graduate? Anyone? That, amen. You're graduating? Amen. That'd be another one. And what are you doing after this? You're, you're going to San Antonio. All right. So we could stay in touch with you too, with, even if it's with five or tens. We could do that. All right. We're very proud of you. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate all of our students, and we appreciate those who invest in them. And I'm glad that's been a part of our church family, and, and we're proud of you. All right, so Philippians chapter 3. I don't, know what was, I don't know what came over me this week that I would title this a love note to Jesus. I must have been, I don't know, something going on. I must have been a little sentimental or something. I was just feeling it this week. But I do know that in Philippians chapter 3, especially verses 4 through 14, we find Paul's testimony of change. And everything that he writes in here is honor to the Lord and what he did. In fact, uh, in the midst of this, in verse, in verse 10 of this passage, if, if you will look at that in your Bible, in verse 10, he expresses his greatest desire for the one who saved him. 
I want to know him. I want to know him. And so in some ways, I guess this is sort of like a, a love note to Jesus for everyone to read. If it's not a love note, if, if the men folk here are a little uncomfortable with that because you've forgotten how to write love notes, you know, <clears throat> uh, maybe, maybe it's a life note to Jesus. This is the man that I want to be in you. This is my desire. Now, I did come across a love note. If, if you need a little reminder what one of these uh, looks like, uh, this, is a, this is a love note. Can y'all see this? It's kind of, it's gone. The, the little love note, it was posted by a mother. It's an in, unidentified fifth grader that wrote this note to her daughter, Abby. And it says, Dear Abby, your eyes remind me of the evening sky. Fifth grader. My heart felt like broken glass until I saw you. And then I felt like I had every Pokemon ever. <laughs> I love how you play Zelda, even when people think it's weird. <laughs> if you liked me, it would be my first ever victory. Isn't that cool? Man, he's got a career. Hopefully he's not a player. You know, he's not a player. He's got a career. Well, in some ways, uh, in some ways, this passage is the apostles' love or life note to Jesus. In, in a way, he's saying, I'm his magnum opus. I'm his great work. The one who loved me, saved me. The one who is with me always, will never leave me. The one who is at work within me. He is the one that is worthy of praise and worthy of pursuit. He's the one. And he says, I want to know him. I want to know him. So he provides for us some truths about knowing Jesus for the graduates and for all of us. Some truths about knowing Jesus. Here's the first thing. We're talking about our relationship with Jesus is not something that can be earned. You don't earn his love. You don't earn his favor. You don't earn his salvation. You receive it in an, in an encounter with him. You receive it. He is someone that you experience. See, But what is said here in this passage is that if anyone, if anyone could earn their way to God based on a human effort, if anyone could do it, it would have been the Apostle Paul. And you see these verses uh, here in verses 4 through 6. Look at this. If someone could think of himself, you know, think of confidence in the flesh. If anybody could get to heaven based on good works, on doing good, it would have been Paul. If he could, if he could achieve rightness with God based on his efforts, it would be Paul. Because Paul says here, he's basically a thoroughbred child of Abraham. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. You see that in there? He is an, he's an eighth dayer. He's an on-timer. That's what it means by circumcised on the eighth day. He didn't, wasn't a come lately or come later person. He, on the eighth day, they, they refer to that as an on-timer, an eighth dayer. Of the tribe of Benjamin. He is, he is of one of the tribes that stayed faithful to the Lord. And regarding the law of Pharisee, Pharisee was like the best of the best of the best when it came to righteous religious people. That was him. Zealous in persecuting the church. And when it comes to righteousness according to the law, faultless, without blame. That's quite a, that's quite a resume, wouldn't you say? 
when it comes to being a good person, that would be him. You know, I think about people who have to hire other people and you have to go through a lot of resumes, different resumes. I came across a resume that, that listed the hobbies, the hobbies of someone. The hobbies were, this is what they wrote, hobbies, hunting, laser tag, animal training, eyebrow tweezing, <laughs> tattoo assistant. Did I hear a yay? As I heard, yeah. Donate my hair to charity. Now I want to tell you something. There, there, you, you need to have a good resume when you go into the business into the business field. You, you need to have a good resume, okay? But you, but your, but your goodness doesn't make you better in relationship with God. It's what He is doing in us that really matters. And so what we find here in these verses is hyperbole. It is Paul challenging. You know, if anybody could get to God based on their goodness, it would be me, he was saying. Because there is a group of people that, that followed Paul wherever he went, wherever the gospel went, that were endangering the very message of the gospel of Jesus Christ that were watering down, that were looking at Christ and looking backwards to the law, that were saying that you could be saved by your goodness, you achieved higher through your goodness, and you need Jesus plus something else. And Paul says, no way. No way. We can't be justified by our effort before God. We're only justified by our faith in Jesus Christ, who alone can save us and redeem us. He said, I'm not going to have any part of that. There's nothing in his heritage, nothing in his human achievement that, can, that leads to the means of righteousness or rightness with God. It is only the redeeming significance of Jesus Christ that makes him a saved person. It is Jesus Christ raised from the dead, died that we might have life. That's, that's what he's talking about. You know what he's doing? He's bragging on Jesus. Amen? He's worthy to be bragged on. And uh, so I think it's like this. You don't want to one day stand before God on the day of judgment and say, God, look at all the good things I did for you. But humbled before the Lord. Here's, so the first thing is you can't, I'm having a thing came unhooked back here. It's driving me crazy. So I'm just going to pull the wire. Sorry. There you go. Does that look okay? <clears throat> So listen to this. We need Jesus. Not Jesus plus something. We need Jesus in us, shaping and changing us. So that's the other thing. It's, we, we can't earn it, but it begins with a life-changing encounter. You see verse 7 and 8? Verse 7 and 8 really begin with the same word in Greek. It's called an adversative conjunction. It's, it's a, com, a comparative. So he says it's comparing what was to what is. What is is much better than what was. That's what he's saying. When you look at verse 7 here and verse 8, something has happened. There has been a significant moment of change that has occurred in his life. He says, whatever was, were, were gains to me, now I consider as loss. That resume, it's loss. What, what is more, that verse 8, what, what, what was before? He said, I consider it as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ as my Lord. To know him as Lord, for whose sake I have lost everything all this other stuff it, it, that I, I spent a lifetime for to make myself better in the eyes of God is throw to the garbage pile that I might gain Christ there becomes the pursuit of his life to know Christ that I might gain Christ so you have this, some of you are accountants, and there's this word, these words from accounting, it is you have a ledger of gains and losses. 
But it's flip-flop for him. Everything that he was spending his life for, he realized was not getting him any closer to God. And he flip-flopped it. And he throws all that to the side. Now, it's, it's important. It's a part of his story, see? But this is not going to get him closer to God. But it is this love relationship with Christ. He is in love with Christ. His life is saturated in a love relationship with Christ. He says, I, that I might gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from law, but, but oh, a righteousness that is found in Christ that comes from that comes from God, okay? So it's a life-changing experience. Now, I want to I want to tell you a, a story of one of my favorite people in my, in my life as a pastor. Now, it, it was at a former church, do not be jealous, because I think some of y'all are pretty cool too, okay? All of you. All of you are pretty cool. This fellow's name was M.L. Hughes. I don't think I'd met anybody that was more in love with Jesus than M.L. Hughes. He lived, breathed, prayed, walked, shined, shared Jesus. And you know, people, you just say, well, I, I, I want to know more. What happened? Well, this is his story. M.L. Hughes was one of those that grew up in a Christian family, became a part of the, the, the Christian community, he was living a life when he was in his mid-40s. They had a revival at his church. And it was in that moment that God spoke to him. That he was living a goodness life. He was living with Jesus as a part of his life. But not at the core. Of who he was. And it was in that night that this, this conviction came over him about making Christ the center of his life. And he did something that was so shocking. He got up from his pew where he normally sat now, a man in his mid-40s, and he went out to the aisle and he came and threw himself on the altar. I talked with other people that were there in that congregation. The pastor was so shocked, he went over and he said, Are you okay? Can I pray with you? Somebody he said, I have come this evening to give my life to Jesus Christ and to be saved. So, well, maybe it was just a transitioning. No, it was salvation. Maybe, maybe it was just a, 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 a step you know, from Savior to Lordship. No, it was a surrender of his life. And the thing was, the, the change that occurred in his life from that moment on was so surprising that it was noticeable. Where Jesus went from being on the periphery, on the edge, where, where being like being good person, to Jesus being at the core of everything that he was. You know, he had a gas station there uh, in, in that little town, that little community, a gas station. And, he, you know, uh, uh, and, and they would change oil and tires and stuff like that and pump the gas for you out there. And it was on the main drag going through that little community. And it was there that he would show, shine, share, tell people about Jesus. And I never will forget on the day of his funeral, a man in his mid-80s that people heard from all over, they came from all over the country to pay tribute to a man that shared Jesus Christ to them by handing them some track, by talking with them while he was pumping the gas, while he was cleaning the windshield, somehow sharing Jesus there was a change. And we, 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 
we see that happen in Paul's life. When you, when you look at this, verse 7 and verse 8, there is a significant change. It, it's like, this is what I had, but now, now, and there's this change that I might gain Christ. What is really most important in life is to know Him. And we know that Paul's life-changing moment occurred on the Damascus Road. Here is this man in his own field, in his own, uh, in his own context, among his peers, has arisen to the heights that was recognizable, that would give you confidence, that would say, this man is, is a man of God, until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. You can read that in Acts 9. And his life is reshaped. God will use all of that training and all of that equipping and everything that is a part of his story, but now it is Christ's story in him. So you can't earn it, but you receive it into your life. Could, could I just ask, what about you? This is not, not asking you to doubt your faith, but this is a challenge to you today, to each of us, to see where we are in context with Jesus Christ. Has there been a moment in time when you felt that emptiness, you felt that depth of conviction of sin, that lostness in your life that brought you to a place where you threw yourself at the mercy of the Lord and said, only you can save me. As it begins in an altering, life-altering, life-changing experience, encounter with Jesus. That happened for me. My, my best buddy shared Jesus with me out in the middle of nowhere, and that seed was sown until that altar, that night of revival, and I came and I laid my life at those steps and said, I need Jesus to save. What you want to do is stand before God one day. And celebrate Jesus. And you say, well, then here's the other, another truth. Now the truth is, is that the goal then of the Christian life is becoming like Jesus. That verse. I hope that you will memorize that verse. I want to know Christ. I want to know him. Yes. I want to know him. I want to know him. Uh, th it's, this word means to know him personally. It, it is a word, that, a verb that in this context that, that is translated in a way to know him intimately. It is often a word that is used to describe the relationship between a husband and a wife in a, in a marriage. It is, it is a word that is used to describe the the kind of love that unites a, two persons so that it's like the, a love of the most important person on this earth. I want to know him. And then he says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, man. This is dynamite power, power of resurrection. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead. We serve a risen Jesus, amen? Amen. A risen Jesus. I want to know that power that raised Jesus from the dead, that is at work within us. I want to know that power. The power that lifts someone up from the pit. The power that lifts someone up out of addiction. The power that lifts the broken. The power that creates hope and confidence within a person's life. The power that overcomes sin. The power that that offers healing and hope, miracles for your friends and family and for your future. 
I want to know that kind of power, the power that brings us from death to life, raises the dead. Look around. You've been raised from the dead, people. Raised from the dead. You know, you're, you're, am I too loud? Okay, I'm getting excited. I, I need some medication. You were dead in trespasses and sin, Paul tells us. Raised us. From death to life. That's noticeable. Uh, from brokenness to wholeness. From, from lost to found. It, 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 the, the, talks of a word that, that spoke all things into existence. That kind of power. Raise the dead, cast out demons, move mountains. That's power. He has that kind of power. And that power that changes us to be like Jesus Say, I can't make myself like Jesus. You can't make yourself like the Lord. But he is at work within us, changing us. And I love that word, metamorphosis. It, it, metamorphosis, changing us to be like him, to act like him. So I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. And then he says, I want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. Let's say that word. Uh, becoming like him in his death. Sufferings. Well, what in the world does that mean? Sufferings. To, 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 to know Christ in this way means we share in the way that he walked. We bear the cross that he carried. We share the death that he died. We suffer with him. So I want to become like him in his suffering. What that means is we share in his pain. We share in his sorrow. What does that mean? Well, whatever grieved his heart grieves our heart. Whatever knocked a breath out of him knocks the breath out of us. Whatever moved him to compassion moves us to compassion. Those moments that led him to lay down his life for those that he loved leads us to lay down our lives for those that he loves. When Jesus saw people like sheep without a shepherd, it says that he was moved to action. When Jesus saw the grief of Mary and Martha at their brother's funeral, it said he felt their grief and he wept. When he saw people who were hungry and hurting and, and homeless and helpless, he stopped, he listened, he prayed, he spoke, he, le he, he helped. Words like generosity, words like sacrifice and action means sharing in Christ's sufferings in a way that's perfect, personal. It means we see what he saw, we feel what he felt, we do what he did. I want to know him. in partnership, participation with his sufferings. And then knowing him is, is a lifetime pursuit. This is, this is in verses 12 through 14. Look at this. You know, we, we're going to pursue, pursue him. We, we know that he saves us, and only he can save us. And that this is a lifetime pursuit, being coming like him. And I just want to say this, not that I've already obtained, he says, all this, or have arrived at my goal, but he said, I press on. And he's using this world out of the a world of athletics, and it's like straining, straining every nerve, straining forward everything that I have for the cause of Christ to be like him, to be in fellowship with him. There are things that we have to, we have to discard and put to the side, and we have to wrestle with in order to move along in fellowship with him, And he says, here's one thing that I do. I, I've not gotten there yet, but one thing I do, I forget what is behind. You got any things that you need to get beyond? 
We need to get beyond some things. There are some past things, some past mistakes and failures in your life. And thank goodness, thank the Lord that we have a God who in Christ forgives us, who is gracious and compassionate. He says, one thing I do, forget what is behind. Strain toward what is ahead, towards the, the goal to be like, like him. So we can't earn it. It comes by, uh, by an in, encounter. Uh, it, 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 it is a, a pursuit of a lifetime that should lead others to Christ. I, I, I read this story of a, of, a, of a person that I guess was uh, wanting to see what people would do, and he's standing on a corner, and he has these gold coins, and he says, $20 coins for $1, $20 coins for $1. All day long, people look at him like, yeah, you're, you're, you know, got some land in Florida, too, you know, they look at him all day long. He just, he had a stack of these coins, $20 coins, just to see what people would do. Finally, just about the time he thought nobody's going to do it, this lady came over reluctantly and said, let me look at one. And she said, it was a gold coin. She, she bit it. She looked at it, threw it on the ground, picked it up. She said, I'll give you a dollar for it. And she walked out. About 10 minutes later, she brought two more people with her and said, we'll take the rest. He's the precious treasure of our lives. And others are to come along because of it. Lord, this is our time of prayer. This is our time of, I guess, uh, our time of, of reflection. <clears throat> Many of us, we are, we, we are in the, we are in a place that's assured for all eternity. Our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but we're not in position where we need to be. I'm wondering if today you would say, Lord, forgive me and bring me into, into closeness with you today. It may be that someone here has heard the story, knows the story, but has not, has not given your life to Christ. Maybe, maybe you've got religion, but not relationship. Would you pray and ask him to be the Lord and Savior of your life right now? It's more than just a prayer. It is a surrender of your life to him. In your way, imagine yourself casting yourself at his altar and saying, save me, come into my heart, forgive me of my sin. So that as I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. When I die, I know heaven will be my home. Thank you for saving me. I will live for you. And then for us as a people of faith, who are we affecting? Positively, Who are we bringing along? Who needs to hear the message of Jesus? That only you can share. So Lord, we, we open up this time of invitation to you. We pray. Now take over. Add to this fellowship. Save the lost. Renew the church. In Jesus' name, amen.